And then as Christians, we begin to say, where am I as a follower of Jesus? Active? Confident? A measure of doubt. Stop. Where am I? Where are you? We turn to the Great Commission. This teaching is the closing verses in the Gospel of Matthew. We know that the Gospel of Matthew was written especially to appeal to those from a Jewish tradition, using that lens to look at Jesus as the true Messiah. Just before the verses that we read, what account was going on? It was wrapping up Matthew's account of the resurrection day. And what were the last verses just before? It was about the soldiers going to the priest and saying, they stole his body, it's empty, it's an empty tomb. And the priest basically saying to these soldiers, hey, we'll take care of you. Here's money, tell no one. Isn't that odd? The resurrection, the women going to the tomb, the joy, the unfolding dawning of a new era, Jesus had conquered death, to human soldiers claiming they fell asleep on the job, and then accepting a bribe, and not seeing this as anything other than all human. Take the money and love. And then in closing, we have this event as recorded. We're looking at all the activity in these few verses. Just think about it. Jesus gathered with his, with his disciples on a mountain just before ascending into heaven. But as we focus on the activity, we realize the fact that they were at the mountain was in obedience because Jesus said, meet me at this mountain. See, in other references and acts and, and the other gospels, other activities went on, but the consistency was go, go to Galilee, go to a place that Jesus said. Obedience. The fact is, Nobody knows exactly what mount they were talking about. But what happened was extraordinary. But when we first read it, it might look ordinary. The first response of obediently finding that mountain and going to it and ascending to the defined location where Jesus arrived, the first response is they worshipped him. You say, well, yeah, we're gathered in worship. We're supposed to worship Jesus a lot, aren't we? I mean, what's unusual about that? For those 11 disciples, it was the first time in their life that they ever worshipped Jesus. Why? They were Jewish. They knew the teachings. You will worship God and God only. And if you worship anything else, you're sinning with idolatry. Idolatry. If they had worshipped Jesus the mortal, and God had said, worship the Lord your God only, you only worship God, and anything else would be treating as a God to worship, you're committing adultery. Jesus was human. He discouraged anybody to offer him adoration. It's consistent through Scripture, and never did the disciples worship Jesus in a formal way, as recorded, until that moment on top of the mountain before Jesus ascended. And why is this okay? Because Jesus is now fully restored. The Word that was created, created in the beginning, the Word that was God, full, unlimited power, all the attributes of God, put aside the, the infinite to the finite. And it wasn't until He was restored that in good conscience the disciples could worship 
the resurrected, the fully established, reestablished presence of God with Jesus glorified by God. Food for thought. We don't know exactly what mountain that the followers went to. But perhaps that was God's way of protecting us because we would have confused and said, oh, we can only worship properly on top of that mountain. And you say, well, okay, Gary, that's interesting, but what do you mean? It means, as human beings, we like to argue about different points of view. Okay, and that goes back to the Samaritans and the Jews and the Samaritan woman asking Jesus, so what mountain is the right mountain to worship at? You people said that mountain, and we say this mountain. Human. Isn't it? We don't know where or why, because we're to worship in spirit and in truth, and the location is not the point. The point is to worship the resurrected, fully empowered presence of Jesus, to worship God, to worship the Holy Spirit, because all are truly one. And then, if we're not convinced yet about our tendency as human beings to get off track, right there. They worshipped two English words, some doubted. Doubt is an intrinsic part of the path of faith. Anyone who has faith at times will doubt. And we must never think that the disciples were perfect followers of Jesus Christ because they were human beings just like us. And Jesus had even predicted and said, yes, people will doubt. Yes, people will have short faith, fall short in their faith. Some will not even believe the power of the resurrection from the dead. And so we see this pattern continue to be manifested. Those who are Christians who recognize that Jesus was God's Son, who conquered death once and for all, we believe. But there are those who do not believe that testimony. And we have to just accept that's part of what it means to live in a world filled with humans. They were obedient and going to the mountain. They took on a whole new dimension in the practice of their faith by worshiping God. And then Jesus said that all authority, all authority now I have. And he's demonstrated that he has that authority because he's conquered death, because he's ascended and been reinstated and is now fully God. And so he comes to his beloved disciples, especially the others who would gather, saying all authority Therefore, and he gives a command. Go make disciples of all nations. Again, perfectly clarified as the gospel was written, quite a few years after the event, at least in the range of 30 years after this event, that as the gospel is written, that it is reminding the readers of the authority of Jesus Christ. And that Jesus as Messiah was, yes, a fulfillment of the promises to the nation of Israel, but it was a promise that was to be spread throughout the entire world. There were to be no geographic boundaries. There were to be no nationalistic boundaries. boundaries. There would be no racial boundaries. As the Apostle Paul wrote later, Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave, and free person. We are all one in Christ. That message was begun by Jesus' direct commandment to worship and then to go make disciples in all nations, a universal appeal to the entire world. The concept of making disciples is to follow, become a follower of Jesus. Remember, by definition, as a rabbi, Individuals have been invited to come and follow, to learn and teach that rabbinic teaching, and then in turn to become rabbis themselves. 
So Jesus, as an itinerant rabbi, invited and said, come, follow me. And he would teach them. He would transform. He would get a new message. He, we believe, had a prophetic voice for his disciples. And especially the fulfillment that he was the Messiah. But that's the dynamic. And in Matthew, especially the readers who had a Jewish background, they understood that dynamic. So to be made a disciple was to be a follower of. And a follower would be obedient to the teaching. And part of the teaching was to demonstrate the faith and the trust that you had in Jesus Christ through the act of baptism. And for us as Baptists especially, the act of baptism is to publicly declare your faith in having accepted Jesus, the inward experience of having accepted Jesus, by an outward demonstration. To go under the waters of baptism. To die to your old self, and then not by your own power, but represented in the person doing the baptism to raise them out of the waters to a new life in Christ. <coughs> Baptized by faith. Buried under the water and by the power of God raised a new life, now and forevermore. <coughs> learning to obey by demonstrating that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. As I preach these words, I invite all of us to remember our own baptisms, whatever the details are in it. And then also to raise the question, have you been baptized? Are you thinking about being baptized? The power of baptism is to personally demonstrate that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Baptizing, teaching, obedience. These are the dynamics of being faithful that goes back to the Jewish life. Jews did not have to be baptized if they were born to a Jewish mother. But John called them to be baptized. There would be a new dynamic introduced. Baptism was an expression of being a father of Jesus Christ. Signs of the follower, following, of being a follower, but also the lesson, which ends with a promise. And surely I am with you always to the very end. How do we apply this to our lives? First of all, to step back and see the bigger picture. The teachings that were left after the resurrection. In Matthew, as we just said, it was a reference to a rabbinic transformation in our lives, of becoming a disciple and a follower of Jesus. In Luke 24 and Acts 1, it talks about being a witness to go and preach repentance. And John the Evangelist, the 20th chapter, with the Spirit empowered and emphasizing the forgiveness of sins. The wider teaching of the New Testament with the appearance of Jesus after the resurrection is that the missionary commission is to go and bear witness. Not fixed on an exact wording of an exact behavior. Go. Where do we go? We go into the world to bear witness of what we have experienced as we have become followers of Jesus Christ. We go to live obediently, just as Jesus has taught us. We go in partnership with God and with Jesus. I am the vine, you are the branches, obediently following me and bearing fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. And part of the fruit of the Spirit is being light. So that we go and bear the light of Christ as the indwelling transformation of the Holy Spirit is manifested in how we live. We go prepared. 1 Peter 3.15 it says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, 
but do this with gentleness and respect. Recently, I saw posted on Facebook something as follows. I am tired of people with mouths full of Bible verses, yet with their hearts filled with hate. Go. Go always and in all places with kindness and love. Any behavior we have as we go forth as a follower of Jesus Christ, as we go forth and seek to live the fruit of the, the Spirit, we can always ask ourselves in what we engage in a behavior, am I being kind? Sometimes kindness manifests itself in having that difficult conversation. But are we doing it with kindness, with love? And as we engage in relationship with people, do they truly know that we are a loving person and we desire to love the individual as we experience them? Go to live fully within our families. Go across the street to allow the light of Christ to shine in our lives. And if we're called, go to specialized ministry. And some are even called to go into foreign, missionary, foreign missions. We know that Peggy and Judy were called, and both were dedicated going and doing ministry in Honduras, and Judy continues, while she can't travel, but to be very supportive of Honduras. We know Fran McNeil, and I hope that that's a familiar name to us, the daughter of a plumber who grew up in Braintree, who happened to be a cousin to Helen Wilcoxon. So when she went with Wycliffe Bible Translator to Bolivia, Helen came to the church and said, will you support my cousin? She responded to the call, we responded to the call to be supportive of her financially. And now, Fran, well into her 90s, well retired, still serving, still in going forth into her community as God has continued to work through her life, expresses her deep gratitude for the ongoing support even into retirement from this church. FBC went to Bolivia because we supported the call of friend. We are not all called to go as missionaries. We are not all called to become pastors. We are not all called to be teachers. But we are all called as uniquely followers of Jesus Christ to bear witness to the light and the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. We are all called to be obedient to the best of our ability, called to support others in prayer, called to support through participation within our church family, called to support to the best of our ability financially, gifts that empower the staff of this church to be faithful to their calling, called to support the missionary efforts of our church. Why? Because there are people who have responded to the call and they need that financial support. Each one of us is called to the best of our ability to engage in that. Why? Because that's light, that's truth, and that's loving. Where am I? Where are you on your faith journeys? May we answer by seeking to be obedient as members of the family of God because Jesus said, go. All authority has been given to me, and as called, we are to go into the world, and surely, Jesus promised, I am with you always. Amen. Amen.
do this in remembrance of him. In one sense, this meal is a very simple demonstration of faith. Familiar words, familiar activities. May we participate with a refreshed and new spirit of the living God. In the, in the words of Jesus, as he gathered with his disciples, he said, This bread is my body, my body which is broken for you. May God bless this bread. And as you take the bread and eat, do it in remembrance of me. In turn, we take this broken bread, Jesus, and the many parts of the body become whole as we partake of this bread in remembrance of you. Amen. In like manner, Jesus also took the cup. An illustration that, if they were thinking at the moment, would have appalled the disciples. Blood was sacred. How an animal was slaughtered for food was strictly governed. And no blood could be in meat in order to be consumed. If there was blood in the meat, it was not kosher. And yet Jesus said, this is my blood. He was identifying that he was the perfect blood of the lamb because blood had the power. And the lamb was sacrificed faithfully to forgive sin. Gracious God, you are a loving God who has given us life. And for the life of your son and for Jesus' obedience with laying it down and shedding his own blood so that we the guilty can be forgiven. This truth is so profound. And yet with glad hearts, we now partake of this cup because we have received this gift from you. With your blessing and being reminded of the power of Jesus' blood, do this in remembrance of him. Amen. And having been unified through the activity of this, the Lord's table, we are now unified through song. As I invite you to stand and sing together, I swear to all. Softly. 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 Softly.